Harry Potter 7 is Matthew 6. Um, I'll just read you some part of that. Matthew, uh, lay not for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust doth corrupt, where thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Blessed heaven. If the light, and it, that, that is this huge break, seemingly in meaning that this is joy. The light of the body is the eye. It's the very next line in the Sermon on the Mount after that passage. So if you, Romans counting on you to look this up. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, that's one eye, John. If thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. Think of Dumbledore at King's Cross. But if thine eye be evil, and evil here is contrasted with single, so we're going to see two eyes somewhere that are evil. If thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. How great is that darkness? If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? No man can serve two masters, for he will hate the one and love the other, else he will hold the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and the man. Now that passage, I think Rome expects you to know because of all the eyeballs inside it. Right? And, and she's cute. She said in other interviews that the headstones are critical to her views because they epitomize the entire series. So I think it's an incorrect use of the word epitomize, but we'll just go on. <laughs> 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 The, the connection with 621, your treasure, and 622, the light of the body is the eye, <coughs> is in Matthew 5. They bless the pure in heart, for they shall see God. The pure in heart, which Delaware constantly refers to Harry, that his great strength is his purity of heart. And that Delaware should have recognized, and that Voldemort should have recognized how dangerous an opponent he was who had the purity of heart to be able to look into the mirror of air set and pull something out. Uh, I apologize, I just want to give you a time warning. It's currently 710. We have to work until 8. It's got, I just want to make sure it's time to go there. I've got about 45, 50 more minutes. We'll <laughs> <laughs> meet out on the street. So. <laughs> Thank you, John. You're welcome. Remember Dante entering paradise. If an eye be single, that is simultaneously ephemeral and eternal, that's a sacramental. Coleridge calls it the esemplastic vision. C.S. Lewis, Lewis uses that word. If ever you see the word esemplastic, you know they've read Coleridge. It's a giveaway. Nobody uses that word. But it means a unifying vision. If an eye be single, that is simultaneously ephemeral and eternal, seeing the divine in the world, seeing the world as a transparency, you will see God. Seek the kingdom of God for this vision, a kingdom and sight that are within you, as the scriptures say in Luke 17 and 21. Now, in 2002, I read a book called The Hidden Key to Harry Potter. And I, I was insane, obviously, at that point, because I said that Harry Potter's name meant that he was an heir of Potter. Now, Potter in Christian scripture, this is not the evangelical book, I'm sorry to say that. It's a Christian thing. English literature is a Christian game. All right? it's, it's essentially until the end of the Second World War, Christian, English literature is just books and poems and plays written by Christians for other Christians for their very life in Christ. Right? And Joanna Rowling is a Christian. She said as much. In fact, she said after the house came down, she said, I thought the Christian symbolism was kind of obvious. <laughs> she said in 2000, she didn't want to talk about her Christian faith because it ruined the ending for everybody. I still had to explain it to everybody. It's kind of scary. Yeah? But that's not unusual, especially today. When I talk about these things, I'm not trying to witness you. I'm not trying to you know, offer you these things. I'm sure you can find that on your own. I'm trying, I am trying to get to the bottom of this book, though. And here is name. When you see the word Potter, if you Google Potter Christianity, you'll get all the churches in North America that are named Potter. You'll get that about 78 pages. Because the potter is used from Genesis to Revelation as the shaper of the human vessel. It's the creative word of God. It's the logos. Okay? And so in Harry's name is the heir of the potter. That means he's not, it's not, it's not Jesus Christ. He's not standing for Jesus. He's not, he's not a Jesus of Nazareth stick man in all the cross or whatever. He is, though, an heir of the potter in that he is the symbol of this logos word. <clears throat> He's a spiritual everyman because Potter is the biblical name of the creator God's word. 
Now, the story picture of Harriet Day Poem as the spirit figure, the Logos, is the invisible person seeing all, seen by no one. The only thing that Harriet has from his family as a legacy, besides the big chunk of gold that he brings, is the invisibility cloak. And when Harriet puts on the cloak, usually with his two friends, so he has this whole person there, when he puts on the invisibility cloak, he becomes the all-seeing eye that no one can see himself. That's who Harry Potter is. And when he looks into the mirror, he sees an eyeball staring back at him. And this eye is an eye which is you know, not his ego self. It's not an ego eye. It's an eye which is this sacred eye that he has his conscience, this shared vision. Harry sees the eye in the mirror because he is the transpersonal eye. Does this answer Dumbledore's question in his cross? Of course it is happening inside your head, Harry, but why on earth should that mean it is not real? It does answer the question. Let's go to King's Cross and see what Harry sees and learns that. Like, this is really, I mean, King's Cross is a great scene. I, I really do love it. I, I'm sure it's going to the movie, but I'm not a movie guy. I've never figured out how to read a movie, so I think this is kind of a lost <laughs> uh, The story sequence, Harry chooses to believe on Easter morning in the Malfoy cellar and Dobby's grave. Yeah. We know this, that Harry makes the big choice of his life to believe in Dobby's grave. Quick question here. How many of you did not cry when Dobby died? You didn't cry? No. You're a very honest person. <laughs> There is housing available. <laughs> I, I do want you to know that there are crack dealers in Philadelphia. Maybe you just died. It was late at night, I'm sure. If you didn't cry when Dami died, then you missed him. Because uh, Harry, at that point, has been debating whether he's going to go for the hallows or whether he's going to go for the work prices in obedience to what that was going to do. There's no glory in the work price thing. And he's he's leaning hard towards the house. I know what it is. I don't know what it is. I got the cloak. I got the who's my cloak there. <laughs> <laughs> and he's, he's doing a little victory dance, and he starts to sit in Dark Boy's name, and everything comes on. So why is he going out in the basement? Dobby saves his life. But Dobby pays the price. Dobby has to do the thing that <clears throat> that he never wanted to do. He had to go back to the house of bad things. That's what Alfred means. He's he's always seen the areas of Christ. He's kind of, he's kind of the, the joking, the uh, allegorical Christian book. It's kind of the joke, right? Um, he's always treating Harry like he's a god. Um, and Harry's like, whoa, what? You think I was Jesus Christ? Yeah. Um, and Dom's like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so he answers the call to go save Harry Potter. And he goes to the place he never wanted to go back to. And he says, I'm, I am a free house. And I have come here basically in service to Harry Potter. And... He takes the blade meant for Harry Potter. He dies sacrificially. And when he dies, Harry Potter the name on his lips. And, and his eyes are important there. We're talking about his eyes afterwards if you want to question about how important it is to what he sees in the drive to the lunar part. Anyway, <clears throat> that moment when Harry does that, he decides to dig his own grave. He insists that they do it manually, meaning he is digging his own grave. He has dying to himself and his ego concern. And in the grave, he never thinks about Dobby. He thinks only about Dumbledore. And then finally, he's feeling the remorse and such, and that this has allowed him to be able to turn off the dark corner. He finally has the mind control he wanted, the remorse and the love he's feeling there. And when he crawls out of his own grave on Easter morning, there he has decided to pursue that. That choice, rising from the grave, he dies to himself and pursues the work process and obedience, not the hours of Jesus. This leads eventually to Snape's memories in the men's scene, the walk in the forbidden forest, the sacrificial death, and love for his friends. He winds up at King's Cross. He wakes up at King's Cross, Buckingham. Right? But he's looking pretty good at Buckingham. He's been working out. He's, been like, hey. he's looking good. He's, he's cleaned up. He's not wearing glasses. Okay? His eyes are perfect. This is weird because in the beginning of the book, Hermione tells us that Harry's vision is hard. He wakes up at King's Cross and he can see things exactly as they are about the threat of vision. And he's got a dry ice going on here. No one knows what's going on. Rolling is specific that he feels things. He sees things. He hears things. Everything is tactile. 
There's sense perception here. This is a real place according to any empirical test. It's real. He sees robes, I mean, he thinks robes, and robes appear. This is pretty weird, though. Right? This, the sense is all that it's material reality. It's a real world, but it's also a really weird world. Uh, first, we have Dumbledore there, and as as Gary notices, he's in great shape for a dead man. <laughs> we have a baby there that cannot be helped, and the Dumbledore's kind of like, they walk. They walk there. Um, and there's no there there. There's no when there. Right? This is a non-local, atemporal place. And it's coming into being as Harry experiences it. Harry describes it in royal terms as a palace and King's Cross. Uh, this is a place of thought and knowing. Now, you know, Harry has his thought about clothes when naked. They become warm robes instantly. He thinks it, it's reality. It's not usual, even in Hogwarts, that would be part of the event, right? You think it, there happened. And twice, Harry is asked a question by Dumbledore, first about how he survived, and then about where they are, and Harry knows the answer. Now, if you've read the previous six books, <laughs> um, this is not Harry's strong suit. <laughs> in fact, but this, in this place, at this place that he calls King's Cross, though there are no trains there and it looks nothing like the King's Cross that we have been in, in 10 pages of that chapter, Dumbledore tells Harry 14 times, as you know, Harry. Now, like Ron, Harry is not the sharpest knife in the world. Um, one of the reasons he asked Dumbledore the question, is this real or just in my head, is because the signature moment in all previous six books is Harry's, oh no, I was totally wrong throughout the entire book again. <laughs> right? So at the end of the seventh book, he goes, whoa, whoa, before you disappear, there I got the beard. Is this totally delusional? Am I mistaken again? Good, Harry's probably going something. <laughs> <laughs> after seven years. <laughs> Um, but in this place, the only thing that Harry doesn't know or realize is the one thing he doesn't want to know. What was that? The only thing that Harry doesn't realize at King's Cross is he doesn't want to know. Who killed Harry? Um, for some reason, he goes blank on it. He doesn't ask about the door. He chooses not to know it. Who's that? Harry on Dumbledore. Dumbledore's sister. Where is Harry? Well, we know from Dumbledore's answer that he's inside his head. Now, this is a pretty weird inside your head. Uh, we also know that it's inside his head because of the power of thought and knowing there. Harry knows everything. There's no mystery here. Harry is at the fabric of reality inside his head. And we know it's also the kingdom within him because he calls it repeatedly a palace and then names it King's Cross, though it has nothing to do with the King's Cross River State. Harry has gone to Logos. The Logos is your capacity to think, this shared vision. Now, this, 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 is, this is Coleridge again. This is the, the Coleridge lady out here is mine. Not this year, this would be the Coleridge lady. The, look, he said that, remember, the coincidence, that, that the base of all knowledge is the coincidence of subject and object. Now, Christians believe that the Logos creates everything. Everything that was made, not everything that was made, was not made except by the Lord. The prologue of John. And this Logos reality can only be known because you have a Logos faculty within you, this conscience, this shared vision.